listeners, one and all, welcome to Regency Rumours, the podcast where a British-American couple recap and discuss Bridgerton, a Netflix Regency show. I'm Jordan. And I'm Kayla, and this time around we are recapping Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story. So this is our first video. I feel like it's going to be quite interesting. So we host Regency Rumours, which is primarily a... Bridgerton podcast where we've recapped each episodes of each of the episodes of Bridgerton, but we thought that we would do a video this time around where we recap the newest Bridgerton spinoff, which I think it's only going to have one season, kind of based on what's what we've watched. Um, it's just going to be a mini series. We've really enjoyed it, so we thought that we would recap it here on the new YouTube channel. We're both writers, and um, I'm a heritage researcher, so we're really interested in looking at Bridgerton for the plots, uh, the characters, um, the storyline. But yeah, we we like exploring a lot of different aspects of Bridgerton from the relationships to costuming, personally for us, on narratives and the characters and the historical aspects. So if you are new to the podcast, that is what you can expect over here at Regency Rumors. With a U. <laughs> With um, a U. Because apparently that became a thing. And I didn't realize it was going to when I first said it. Yeah, yeah. So some of our listeners know that uh, Rumors in the UK has an extra unit that um, US doesn't have. Extra U? Yeah, it has an I'm extra. Sorry, it's more that's... complicated, really, is mm -mm. what it is. It's not so, an extra U. It is... It's an unnecessary U. Everybody knows no, 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 what no. Rumors is. The, there doesn't need to be an extra U. No, because it's not a rumor. It's a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay look it's just odd anyway so we'll start with our initial reactions of the overall show we're not going to do it episode by episode um for this mini series i guess yeah we yeah we're just going to cover um queen charlotte all now yes. so and then after that we'll talk about the kind of three main storylines as we saw it through the show and then we can end with a history moment as we usually will so it might be a little bit of a longer episode. It might not. We haven't timed it because we're <laughs> professionals. We're professionals. So what were your initial thoughts um, about Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story? I thought that the show was really good. I am a big fan of miniseries. I think that miniseries can be harder to write than several seasons of a show because they have to get it right this one season. And I think them covering the story of Queen Charlotte, Violet Bridgerton, and Lady Danbury all in this one series when they were younger, it was really impactful. I think the most meaningful part of this series was the relationship between Queen Charlotte and King George and his uh, mental illness and them navigating what that would look like for them as a couple. I think so often we have this obsession with royals. And I mean, we see it now even with the, the coronation. 18 million people watch the coronation. People love uh, royal families and thinking of themselves as royal and what royal life would be like. And so we have so many TV shows and films like, you know, The Prince and Me and the princess switch and all these, you know, Prince for Christmas. I have definitely seen those films. <laughs> There's so many of them and they're fun to watch, but all too often those shows have this prince being very stoic and he's almost a bit boring and perfect because all of the problems with the couple are external. So an evil stepmother or mother-in-law or She's a commoner, so the world doesn't want them to be together. And it's never about the couple themselves. So it's, we always see this story where the couple, the, it's about them getting together. And then we end with, ooh, happily ever after. Well, in this, it starts very early on that they, they get married, I think, in the first episode. And we then watch this couple have to navigate life as a married couple and deal with things like physical and mental illness. And I thought that was really meaningful and impactful because especially portraying royals on TV and film, oftentimes they're seen as perfect. And we know that the reality is there's their families just like any other family. You have people with mental illness in your family or physical illness or, you know, the 
weird uncle in your family. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. I think what's really but you interesting, get what I mean. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting about what you were saying there about how the prince is often portrayed as this kind of like perfect picture mm-hmm. and character. That still comes from all of the fairy tales and all of the the stories that we used to tell that obviously stemmed from similar time periods as as the Regency era and and the kind of medieval stories that we told of chivalry and, and exactly knighthood. chivalry and the the kind of the knight in shining armor mm. uh, stereotype so that is is quite interesting isn't it because it was always supposed to be this kind of perfect man that would come and and rescue you from the tower that you were trapped in yes. um, as a princess um or something like that which we've carried on into the modern era in terms of storytelling so it is quite interesting that this is one of the, uh, let's say, more prominent examples of a monarch who did have health issues that, you know, even today we're not 100% certain of. But at the time, they were desperately trying to hide because the royals, the kings, the queens, they had to be perfect. Mm. Um, and they said that throughout the show multiple times. The crown is fine, you know all is well you know yeah the princess dowager kept repeating those kinds of lines because it was so important that if the monarch wasn't fine if the monarch wasn't well then the whole nation collapsed yeah so pretty interesting i thought that the casting was right on par for uh queen charlotte and lady danbury um, the younger versions. The younger versions. I thought the casting was really on par for the both of them. And the fact that they would have these flashbacks be right from the younger version to the older one, like looking out of a window or thinking about, you know, the past. And you could just see the similarities in their faces. There's a name for that in filmmaking. I've forgotten it um, because I'm not a filmmaker. <laughs> Um, which is really useful. I should have looked it up. But, you know, when they do that thing where you match a shot yeah. with the two characters or, or something like that, there is a name for that technique. I don't I don't know what it is, but I... It's really cool. I'm glad that they did it. Yeah, it, it was really cool. And I think that I think that even the mannerisms of the younger women, the actresses, did a really good job of that. Lady Violet, a little less so. I mean, I, th- I think the, the actress was great she did a good job but in terms of the striking similarities i didn't see it as much i don't think it was that big of a deal she was no. the, the younger actress was playing a teenager so a lot of times you know comparing those things are are harder but even um brimsby the um uh, the butler the queensman the, the queensman his comparisons were were very good in in my mind um but uh, yeah yeah Vi- uh, violet less so I, I think it was just less noticeable maybe but i i still uh, think they did a really good job with casting I think that some of our perhaps misgivings with Violet's character was more the storyline, things that were going on, yeah, as opposed to the casting not being right. Yeah, you might be right. Yeah. You might be right. Well, we'll get into that. So, what did you feel? What What were your initial reactions? I think the the underlying story, and we'll, we'll talk about this as we get into each of the three kind of main storylines. Um, I thought it was really good, and the theme was quite clear at least to us um and it was clearly about well first of all women older women in particular being allowed to have a love life but yeah. but not just not just sexual not, uh, physical or anything like that but emotional as well and that's what we're going to talk about in this episode about the three different ways that the show portrayed women in love it did a really good job i think of showing those three different avenues um, which obviously we will talk about more as we get into um, the characters. But another thing that I really liked from this show that is kind of a trope that I enjoy in anything it, it turns up in is seeing the story from another character's point of view, another main character's point of view, but the same scene from two different sides. And uh, you know that thing where you start a scene again and it's literally the same shot that they just reused but then the camera follows the other character. <laughs> oh, so you're talking about when they kind of flipped it halfway through the season. Yeah, about and, episode three. And showed all of the instances where Charlotte was confused about things going on with George. George. And then it turned out that his motivations were not what she thought they were, that he had an entire backstory all on his own. Of course, yeah. Um, mm. Of his own difficulties that 
showed why he wasn't responding to her or why he ignored her on their honeymoon, yeah. that sort of thing. And it made everything clear to, to us. And I was okay with the repetition of it because it was nice to see this kind of reveal of why he did the things that he did. Yeah, and it, it wasn't... But that's the thing, though. It wasn't just repetition for repetition's sake. It was literally, you repeat a scene as an intro to his path. So you would literally see his character going through his story moments and then you get to a scene like when she's trying to climb over the wall in the garden yeah. and then you go oh okay that's how he got to there or you see the beginning of a scene like when they first get back to buckingham house and then in the first time that we saw that charlotte walks away and the camera follows charlotte but then in the second time we see it it follows george and we then go with him and so i really like that it's a trope that i think is really cool yeah so so yeah uh first impressions were pretty positive cool. to be honest so we're going to start with queen charlotte because obviously that's the title of this show and she's the main character one of the things that i found interesting i was reading in an article the other day about um shonda rhimes creating this mini series they were asking about other spinoffs if she'd be interested and she said to be honest she wasn't expecting to make queen charlotte um, Queen Charlotte isn't a character in the books for Bridgerton. So I think that's um, kind of strictly a Shondaland thing. And I think she yeah. got so enthralled with the the historical figure of Charlotte and wanting to know more that she was like, I just had to make this story as kind of a spinoff. And so it was more of a passion project for her. She She really felt strongly about this character and about showing her story and her backstory that she wanted to create this series um, based on this historical figure. Yeah. And hmm. um, so I don't know if we'll get any other spinoffs, but I think that... I think it, it probably depends on how low her bank account gets. I mean, Shondaland <laughs> has a lot of money. So, um, and clearly Bridgerton has been a success on Netflix. So I think that, I don't know, this this is probably an experiment of how these spinoffs could go so like with Grey's Anatomy she well, did private practice I was going to say don't don't many of her shows have spin-offs yeah that they kind of exist in the same in the same world story yeah. world and yeah. then they go off and they you know you see different parts of it and they do that with a lot of um soap operas really don't they um mm. what are the I don't know if it's a, a Shondaland thing but it's um like the Chicago Fire Chicago PD, that those ones, right? Yeah, I've never seen those, but I've heard that yeah, there's like uh, spin-offs of each other. And like yeah. all the NCIS or um yeah. Yeah, the the crime ones. The CSI. C yeah, yeah, the C like CSI, CSI Miami, Miami and Yeah, so I, I other places. I could I could see Bridgerton being something where they could expand to other characters. Um uh maybe it would be cool to see not just the aristocracy, but people who are middle class or Ooh, i don't know that's probably a bit of a tougher one though because yeah because of the fairy tale aspect fairy tale aspect yeah. which we've talked about many times yeah. with, with bridgerton and because bridgerton is so different from something like downton abbey yeah it's it is difficult to kind of show that how do you how do you have an uplifting um story about lower classes the the, the lower classes yeah. who had nothing <laughs> yeah um, it's hard at that time period anyway um speaking of the opposite of having nothing queen charlotte has i think in every scene a, a new it seemed like to me anyway a new wig a new piece of jewelry a new dress um <laughs> i definitely think through this series her hair got even more elaborate and it was already elaborate in season one and season two but it just got so elaborate in this series, and I loved it. It felt like every scene, almost every episode, that her hair just got higher and higher. I mean, it was a wig, right? They didn't just, like, dye her hair <laughs> a, a weird shade of grey. You're such a man. Do you think any woman has that, like, volume of hair? I mean, those Who knows? wigs were so high. The And we're, we're speaking of the, the older... Charlotte, yes. of course. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the younger one had a couple of wigs, maybe. Um, nowadays, wigs look so real that it's it's hard to tell when people have hair pieces. And sometimes I I try and like point it out to you, like when we're watching Game of Thrones and stuff, and the uh, women yeah, will have these 
intricate like braids on and you'll just think it's natural hair and i'm like there's no way that's natural hair you know there is some way that it's natural hair i think that they do a good enough job to make it look natural it does but the volume that they put in hair especially in shows like game of thrones or bridgerton there's no way you could achieve those hairstyles i know i mean for the majority of them you can tell but (laughs) but there you know one or two you kind of like that looks a little bit more realistic i mean yeah yeah you know, it's obviously going to have some kind of like thing in it to shape it she had some that looked like fans and things yeah like really intricate they looked really interesting um i saw but... on instagram where somebody has a wig like one of those like marie antoinette wigs like that um where it has a a wine hatch where you can open it and you can get an entire wine glass out of it um, and then she closes it back up and it's just a wig again. But she had a full, like, glass of wine inside of it. That sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. All, all it would take is a head nod and <laughs> the wine. Oh, I mean, I don't know how it worked, but it was very it was very interesting. So, But one of the things I, I thought was really good um, about this is that they had her with kind of her natural black hair or naturally textured black hair um and that being seen as royal i thought that was really impactful the, for the this series charlotte. yeah yeah mm-hmm. i was looking up the real charlotte because historians believe that there's a possibility that she could have been black and so you see some of the images of her as a younger woman and her hair the the texture of her hair matches the actress that plays her queen charlotte really? yeah I'll, I'll try and see if i can put an image up on on the video to show that you know the the similarities and the texture and some of the hairstyles that she had when she was younger um were similar to the paintings of the real queen charlotte so i thought that was really cool that you could see these bigger hairstyles and black hair texture as royal hair in a show like this i thought that was really cool and then of course the designs were just crazy amazing and so they're they're really just like a thing to behold in the series and it's fun to to see what different hairstyles that she's going to come out with every yeah. episode that definitely see, was where the budget went <laughs> the real charlotte did come from the same place in germany well uh, as they were portraying as the... they portrayed in the show oh, yeah. okay um and part of that which i guess could be part of the history moment or talking about the character so you know let's go for it um but part of that is because and they didn't go into this in the show I think that's because it's the lighter fantasy kind of show, right? Um, But they didn't go into the fact that as a Protestant nation, the king had to have a Protestant wife, had to be religious. Historically, they they tried to make sure she was demure. Pure. And pure and and all these different things. So literally, the, the only places that they could look for this potential wife was Scandinavia and Germany. Yeah. Because everyone else was cast Catholic. Yeah, yeah. So that that is why the pool was so um tiny for where they were looking for George because she had to be of a certain age. Childbearing age. She had that to be of ch- key- childbearing yeah. age. Um yeah, they wanted her to be Protestant, like you were saying. And they had she had to have these specific qualities where she was demure, quiet, sensible, mm-hmm. smart, but not overbearing you know all the things that they saw as queen like at the time yeah but i think it's interesting because in the show there's a little bit in episode one there's a little bit of a suggestion that the reason that they went to germany for a a wife for the king was because in germany no one knew the rumors yeah and they didn't know what he was like so in the show it's a it's portrayed a little bit more that it's like oh we need to trick someone into becoming the queen because she won't know that he's mad uh, as far as i can tell wasn't necessarily the case it is true that he was showing kind of initial signs um when they were a younger younger couple but apparently they did enjoy a long marriage before he showed any major signs of that and they they enjoyed a um a very loving marriage so mm-hmm. yeah it was it was interesting for us looking at the historical aspect so we will get into that later but yes. um I I feel like that the relationship between George and Charlotte was the the strongest in this series. I think her growth progression in this series was really good in terms of her learning who she was as a person. She comes to this new country. She doesn't know 
the people and the culture and she's young. She says she's 17. So that's, you know, she's a child. And then she's got to marry this guy that she doesn't know. I would imagine she has a lot of resentment and confusion. And we see all of those things play out with this couple. And you see kind of the immaturity of them both not knowing what to do. He doesn't know how to navigate having this mental illness. How could he? But he also feels like he needs to hide it yeah. and he needs to be perfect. And then you've you've got the meddling mother-in-law in between the two of them trying to control what happens with them as a couple. And so I... Well, it, it wasn't even that though, was it? Mm -hmm. Because the Princess Dowager, um, the king's mother... She she wasn't just trying to control them. She's literally trying to control the nation. Yeah, and, and yeah. that the the way that she did that is by controlling George and then therefore uh, Charlotte. So quite complex, really, if you think mm. about it. I mean, it is Game of Thrones level of uh, manipulation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, all of this is very social, isn't it? Like it's yes. very social manipulation in in something like this. But I I think it was really interesting watching her at the beginning of the series not really know what to do about him but also being obsessed with wanting him to like her i i thought it was really interesting when she was talking with lady danbury and lady danbury was like you need to get your head in the game yes. and stop worrying if a guy likes you or not you're the queen you know, you have responsibilities and things that you need to be attending to. And here you are wondering if he likes you or not. And the truth is, is that she had to navigate both, really. I mean, that's marriage is all about compromise and figuring, figuring out what works between the two of you and having kind of your separate goals that then come together and having to wade through all of that your whole life. So it's inter interesting that you should say that about marriage and coming together and things like that considering that um right now um i'm the only one wearing my my ring i forget it when we're at home okay oh. i do i mean when we go in public i have it on but his you know is and this isn't public it not like out in public you know like dear listeners <laughs> today my wife decided you're trying to be was... lady whistle down <laughs> <laughs> i think the portrayal of the the relationship between them at the beginning of the season was it was quite interesting because it was at that point we still didn't know really yeah what was going on um but at the beginning we don't know what's going on exactly we don't know why he's acting the way he's acting and and things like that and we see it purely from charlotte's point of view so we do have that interesting kind of dichotomy between how he acts when they're together and then how he acts after and there's no there's no more kind of performance to be had and that kind of thing so we see it through her eyes and we see that journey. Mm. I think that's quite interesting. Even though Queen Charlotte is kind of this fantasy, you know, version of, of Queen Charlotte and George's story, I thought one of the, the most powerful parts of Charlotte's journey is seeing her go from, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, and kind of going, things need to be perfect. I'm a princess and he's you know, a king and, and, and things need to be perfect and we need to have kids and we need to go to social events and stuff like that to her going, I, I am in control of my life now. We're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days and we're just going to embrace both of those. And if that is not just what marriage is, I don't know what is, you know, yeah. you, you strip all of the kind of, you know, Cinderella in a, in a pumpkin and going to the ball and everything being perfect. You, have stories like this where she's accepting the fact that that their reality it's it's never going to to change like he he was never going to get better in fact he probably was going to get worse and she decided i love him he loves me i loved that scene where she was like do you love me mm -hmm. and that was that was all that was all i'm gonna get emotional but like that was all that's all that they needed to say and then she's like right if we love each other we deal with it and that's that's marriage you know so yeah and i think it is good like that scene in particular that they didn't move towards the the fake breakup thing yeah where he says or he refuses to say that he loves her 
Mm. And then, you know, because in some other shows, you would have had a, a scene where he refuses to say it and she just accepts it at face value and storms off. And yeah. Then, and then we have half a, an episode where, you know, oh, I'm not talking to him because he's being mean and, and that kind of a thing, yeah. which would have been quite childish. I, I It's really good that the way that in, although you, you said before, she's portraying a teenage yeah. Charlotte at that point. She, as she says in, in the show, she's 17 Um, in those earlier scenes. Yet she kind of approaches that with a little bit of wisdom that yeah. you don't always see in younger people. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you don't see it in people generally, but no. um, there's a little bit of wisdom there in saying, well, hang on a minute. No, I can see that there's a connection here. I can see that there is love here for whatever reason he's trying to protect me from something. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Because she had her suspicions at that point that there was something wrong, but she didn't know what it was. And so she's basically, she's putting the pieces together. And I think that is, you know, as as, as far as a romance storyline goes, I think that's pretty good for not going down the kind of the well-worn track. I put in my notes, Queen Charlotte didn't sell us on a fairy tale. It sold us on a flawed, young, immature couple with serious mental and physical problems to face in their marriage. And we see them working out how to do that. That line, you can be a person with me, was, I think, the pinnacle of mm. this whole series. You can just be a person mm. with me. Just George. Yes. I loved that. Just Farmer George. Which I was surprised about. We'll probably get into that. But the real King George was also obsessed with farming. So mm. there was, a, I guess for me, I had this image of this being so fantastical that there would be absolutely nothing other than kind of the names of the characters that would be the same. And in reality, there was a lot of stuff that was fact that was fabricated in a very fairy tale way. But I, I was surprised at how many things we looked up that we were like, oh, actually, this was in the series. <laughs> This wouldn't be a Bridgerton series if we didn't talk a little bit about the saucy stuff. We try and make it we try and make it very like um you could watch this video at work or listen to this in the car. So we don't really go too much into the sexy stuff. But I will say that um I I liked the fact that they showed them having kind of a, a, a healthy relationship because a lot of times there is a stigma um, for people with mental illnesses or people with genetic disorders like Down syndrome, kind of being infantilized and being seen as children where they can't have physical relationships or people believe that they, they can't have rom romantic relationships because there's something wrong with them. And in reality, um, a lot of people that have different backgrounds have successful relationships, have long marriages, and they're they're not supposed to be seen as wrong. They deserve to have have love and have relationships like anyone else does. So I, I like the fact that we did see that he had bouts of struggling with his illness, but then he had he also had bouts where they were really happy as a couple and, you know, doing what what young married couples do. And so I thought that was um you know, some of the, the sex scenes were a bit much for me, but I... A, a bit much. <laughs> a bit I much. Think, I mean... But, but I, I will say, in, in terms of that, like, seeing seeing them as a, a couple and not making it seem as if um, him having mental illness meant that he wasn't allowed to have a normal marriage. Right. I thought that was a positive thing. Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> so the one... Well, there's a couple things. But in terms of Queen Charlotte's story, the one thing I wasn't as crazy about was her being older was a bit disappointing. I, I felt as if there were kind of some, some holes in her character. I was expecting that from her lessons of dealing with her mother-in-law when she was younger and everything that happened between her and George and the problems that they had to face, that as an adult, she would behave differently. And it wouldn't just be about the line of succession that yeah maybe she was into gossip and things but to do with her own children she would be kind of more of a, a loving mother and maybe that was the reason why her kids had not pursued getting married yet and having having kids because she had just 
been a nurturing mother and that's why that they didn't feel compelled to and then maybe at, at you know some point in the series she went oh, you guys you need to you need to have some babies i feel like they went down the road of like her her being an absent mother kind of and then we never see her resolve that they they have that scene where the kids are like you weren't a mother to us you're a terrible mother and then there was nothing to where she apologized later or she was like oh gosh i should have been a better mother we basically just see that in her older life she's become her mother-in-law i guess i expected when we were seeing those gloomy scenes of her and stuff and her kind of berating her children i thought okay well at the end of the series we'll see her apologize to them and say look all that matters is that we're family and we love each other and everything that's happened with your father is the reason why we just need to celebrate being family and instead like the last scene of her is like hugging one of her son's necks being like thank you so much for making another baby and she learned no lessons so i feel like that was hard i didn't i didn't quite like that so in terms of characters that's not great Mm -hmm. to not have a progression to have a change in in your character if you don't have a change in your story then that's typically not seen as great however that's where this show kind of has to be examined in a slightly different light because it is a Bridgerton story it is a spin-off using characters from the show Bridgerton obviously and because it's a spin-off you cannot guarantee as the creator that people will watch it you can probably assume that fans of Bridgerton are going to go ahead and watch Queen Charlotte here we are exactly however you're making a show called Bridgerton and you've got series one, two, three, four, five. You can't presume that in the future somebody coming to the show and watching seasons one, two, three, four, five are going to realize that at the end of season two, you actually need to go and watch this entirely other different show with a, with a slightly different name um, in order to get the backstory for characters of what's going to happen in three, four and five. Mm. So in terms of, of making too many changes to your characters between seasons, that's a, that's a that's a pretty dangerous place to be because then somebody could start watching the next season of Bridgerton and go, well, hang on a minute, how how's that happened? Why is that character like that now? And that's all. Oh, that's because that happened in this other show. That does happen. Um, it happened in The Mandalorian with the Book of Boba Fett. Oh. And it's not good. People complained about it, but when I think it was season two again of Mandalorian, then they did the Book of Boba Fett. There was a whole series. Halfway through that series, Mando came in and we had <laughs> we had changes to the character. We had things happen in that series that if you didn't watch The Book of Boba Fett, the third season of Mandalorian makes no sense. And that is honestly not great because you're relying then on people following things outside of your show. I didn't really even think about that. I think because in my mind... I I have a few complaints about Queen Charlotte's character as she is older and not really feeling like Violet's had any sort of real substance to her character this this series. But it makes sense that if they need to bottle this to where if you watched it as a standalone or if you didn't watch this at all, that you could jump back into Bridgerton and those characters would be exactly the same. I guess that makes sense. I get it. It just means that there were aspects of these characters in present day that seemed a lot more surface level than they should have been. Well, because again, though, this always happens when you're telling stories out of chronological order as well. Because when we've got Bridgerton and we've got Queen Charlotte, we've got Violet, we've got Lady Danbury as they are in the current day. And I did that with air quotes for those who are not watching. We've got characters that we already know where they end up. And so then when you're looking at how they got there, there's a bit of a disconnect. And you, when you're, you're going back in time, so you're not only are you telling more of the story after the end of season two of Bridgerton, which, because they did, yeah, because they mentioned that Anthony was on his um, honeymoon and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? So... We know that it is canonically taking place after the end of the season two and before season three. So we know that there's going to be some kind of advances in the story. You're then also showing parts of the the past that we've never seen before, the impact on those characters. And so, you know, it's it's quite complicated. And doing that, I think, is, is relying on the fact that fans today 
are not only able to watch everything but are willing to because yeah. you know back in the 80s and the 90s you couldn't really do that with um primetime telly on you know a, a weekly schedule um where if you missed half an hour on monday night or whatever it was then you missed it yeah um but today with with netflix obviously we can watch it all in one we can watch it again we can watch it out of order if we really wanted to so it's i think it's an evolution of television storytelling absolutely um but it is i think it it kind of hits on some of the things that you were just talking about in terms yeah. of perhaps why it's a bit strange that queen charlotte as a character didn't have that evolution that change and it's probably because she had to go back to exactly the same point yeah she needs to be kind of <clears throat> gossipy and authoritative and everything yep. and so her having any sort of major change means that she's not still like that so i think it's unfortunate for this this series i would have liked to see a different a, almost a more vulnerable version of her hmm. in the present that we saw like a hint of when she'd have those private conversations yes. with brinsley where she was like i am a good mother but it it never went any farther than that. There was no other depth to her, after and we saw so much depth as a young person. There yes. there was so much vulnerability, yeah, depth to that character. But then you then you don't see it as adults. So that a bit of a bummer. But other than that, I thought you know the actresses were great, of course, and it was nice to see Charlotte have a a backstory and uh, a love story that continues on despite the challenges that they had and just as like a very small side note i liked seeing that last scene when the two of them are laying under the bed and it shows them as young people and then as older people i liked the fact that they showed him as an old an old man he's got wrinkles and everything he's got white hair he's not perfect he's older and so many of our representations of of princes are are young and perfect and gallant and all those things that we were talking about with chivalry and things. And here he is, is a king older. He's basically lost his mind mm -hmm. and they're still in love. And I thought that was really powerful. I liked seeing, and Brinsley too. I like seeing him as an older man. He's, you know, not young and, you know, he's, he's put some weight on. He's got a few wrinkles and there's nothing wrong with that. That's what happens to people. Mm -hmm. And so it's nice seeing that, you know, we can see those types of people on, on television and that be normal and a part of the story. It doesn't have to be fantastical all the time. People don't have to look perfect and, you know, hot with his shirt off all the time. That representation of him, of, of King George being older and vulnerable as an older person is really um impactful yeah so um we kind of talked a little bit about king george's story how they approached that in the in the sense of he's not just prince charming he's he doesn't stay static he's not perfect etc etc type thing so i think the i think the storyline for george was also quite interesting because it wasn't just a case of a man happy with power, then getting to kind of control things and, and, you know, do whatever he wanted and that kind of thing. Because obviously we saw a lot throughout the show um, of Princess Dowager, um, his mother kind of controlling things from um, behind the scenes with like uh, Lord Bute, who was the prime minister. They kind of, they mentioned that, they didn't make it clear. Lord Bute was the prime minister, which was why he was such a pain. Um, and then the other dude whose name I completely forget. The doctor. No, the the other one that appeared in the scenes with Lord Butte. I don't know if he yeah, was I don't remember. So it doesn't really matter. But but they those three were kind of seen to be pulling the strings of the country, right? Um, and then you've got George, who wants to be just George to Charlotte, which we've already mentioned, uh, which was a really powerful kind of um, statement. He he wanted her to see him as just George himself, which is which is great. Um, Obviously, we, we throughout the series, we see that that is not only because people only ever see him as a royal, as the king, but it's because as well, there's lots of people who just see him as the king, but also kind of like mad and mm. all these other things that they've said and, and, and he has to deal with. And so he's dealing with a lot. But I think one of the, the other interesting things 
um, as the monarch with with ultimate power um, at that time period was then the interactions between him and then the doctor mm. because the way that the medicine worked at the time with bloodletting and and leeches and and the humors of the leg and the humors of the stomach and things that they mentioned in that the one episode and stuff and then the approach to mental illness um and madness as they called it was not great um for that character as the king to give that authority to a commoner i think he was a commoner the doctor was um obviously a key part of the story and it also got to the point where it strained my suspension of disbelief a little bit because if this we've already talked about how this is a quite a fantastical show um and you know we know that we go into that being aware of that and i think with the slightly darker themes of this series mini series whatever you want to call it when you've got a king who is literally the divine representation of of god on on your in your country then being held down <laughs> effectively against his will by four men in a bucket of ice cold water and then his the king's man comes running in reynolds comes running in and going what are you doing to him and then he just kind of like lets them get on with it really i mean from kind of the research that we've looked into the the doctor i can't remember his name now um, Monroe or something. yeah i think it was um dr monroe um he was a real person and apparently some of those practices he he did on on king george so what we don't know is whether or not king george um agreed to them at the time in the show it portrayed that he was all for it and he yeah. he agreed to to it because he thought that it would help him and thought that it would help his relationship with charlotte but i i don't know whether or not the real king george yeah i mean it, whether or not the real king george would have allowed that is is not really kind of the point i'm making though it's the point is that the people around the king would absolutely not have let that happen so if you remember, i mean i disagree i, I think mm, remember the scene when um he first, he got he uh they're, they're about to get married um, this is later on. This is when we see it from George's point of view. He comes out of the antechamber um, into the outdoor corridor, whatever you want to call it, and the, the doctor's there, and then the doctor slaps him. And then those soldiers in the background come out and they get their swords are halfway drawn, and the king stops them. The only reason they stopped is because George said, no, he's right. In any other instance, if the king is unable to say stop, those soldiers kill that man, arrest him, whatever they do, right? And and if this was a slightly darker show, a slightly more realistic show, that that would have been a plot point. Reynolds would have gone. He would have gotten the soldiers. They would have taken the king out. Do you know what I mean? Like I know, I know that there were certain medical practices that actually happened. I just, I don't know. It was, yeah. I disagree with you. I think that kings like George were already so manipulated and controlled that really they didn't have their own lives anyways. And if he was already being controlled by his mother in certain ways then why why wouldn't he be controlled by a doctor and that would be fine because it's not control it's like you've got these random men commoners who are putting their hands on the king you just you just didn't do it i i don't know it just seems quite far-fetched i disagree i, I yeah, think it i think yeah. it would have happened and i think it it would have been a bit more medieval for them to just take the guy and kill him by this point. I know things like duels and stuff were still okay, prominent, well, but the Tower of London at least. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't. Put I don't... him in jail. <laughs> Put him in jail. I feel like by this time it wasn't as brutal as as the medieval ages were, but um... medieval ages and and this one's the historian. Eh? Um, so I think what would be really interesting though is if we did get. Um, our friend's opinion on this which yes is an upcoming i thought we'd already done it apparently it's not released a discussion with one of our good friends dr zoe chadwick who um her thesis was in representations of uh, medicine in 1700s 1800s i think it was more in the victorian period victorian period but there we go she she's very knowledgeable in um other time periods about um, things like disability yes 
and the representation of it. The representation so. of, of disability um, in the past. So we recorded an episode with her, oh goodness, probably almost a year ago now, but that we haven't released yet. We're going to, um, but she spoke on the Duke of Hastings stutter when he was a child, what that would have been like for a person in the Regency era to um, go through life with a, a stutter and how people would have treated them, what the representations of that would have been like. And it was a really interesting discussion with her. So we're thinking about having her back on again. Um, as a follow-up. As a follow-up to to talk about um, King George and what it would have been like for, for him to um, suffer with this unknown illness that we still today don't really know what it is. Yeah, and we'll talk about that more when we kind of get onto that, um, because we still haven't really talked about the other two main storylines. <laughs> yes. And we've been talking for probably about an hour. <laughs> an hour, yeah. So um, so I think one of the interesting things about the King's story and the relationship between Charlotte and George was the fact that it didn't necessarily rely completely on that trope of just not telling each other things. Mm. It it did a little bit, but it because that's big in period dramas. Is it is. People just yeah. not the the whole plot point will uh, ride on whether yes. or not a couple, or in the case of like Pride and Prejudice, whether it's sisters tell each other things. A whole plot in period dramas can rely on the fact that two people just haven't communicated that are yeah. very close to, or supposed to be very close to each and other. And it's infuriating. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I think I think it's really good that they did actually, they communicated, they talked through it and, and Charlotte became such an advocate for George. I think that was that was really great. And I think one of the really interesting things about the show is that it, it touches on um, men's mental health mm. quite strongly quite quite well because it's still it is still to, i think it's getting better but it is still a thing today where men believe that they can't display emotion um because it's seen as weak or seen as wrong um you know but there were literally you know you tell young boys don't cry boys don't cry right you know that's a, that's a thing <laughs> that people were telling each other for decades to have a, a character deal with the mental health aspects of an illness like this because any kind of illness that is physical also comes with mental components we know that now um but they don't you know they don't deal with the mental health components very well in the past we pretend that they do it really well today but you know that's a, that's a different thing obviously that's still a major issue today is talking about men's health and as a character it's difficult because You've got someone who, in this case, actually does need to be physically fit, mentally fit, or else, right? They see it that way, yeah. No, no. If, if there's one character, or one person, rather, in the entire country that has to do that, it is the monarch. Mm. You know? Because at that time period, um, the monarch is the country. The country is the monarch. And without the monarch being you know, perfect, then the whole country goes down the drain pipe. Mm. You get ousted, there's a chance that you get your head chopped off. I mean, it was literal, like, life or death for, for monarchies that didn't do well, right? And so, anyway, I think it was it was an interesting thing, though, because um, if, if your monarch isn't of perfect mind or body, then bad things can happen. I mean, look what happened with Britain and those pesky Americans. <laughs> I mean, it's literally this time period. It is. It, it is. Was him. They. It. I mean, they don't. They don't talk about that on this show. That is why I think it's so important that at the very beginning of this show, they said, you know, this is about Queen Charlotte based on Bridgerton because the realities of you know we we've talked about some of the personal realities of George and Charlotte and his mental illness and uh, her potentially being black and kind of some of these facts that really could have been true. But there's there's also the the realities of colonization and slavery at the time and the British Empire and all of the effects of that to to other countries and 
the show grasping onto the fact that this is a Bridgerton story is really important because they don't mention anything about this George being the one that was on the throne during the um, American Revolution. I think there was there was also other wars that they were the UK was involved in. The Seven Years' War, France, Napoleon, like all, yes. all of these kinds of things are around that time period. And um, I think the official um, term for this is um, a hot mess. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say something serious. No, I thought I thought you had like looked up a historical term, and I was like, oh. <laughs> no, the, the the official term is a hot mess. Yeah. Um, so obviously, there is a lot that we're we're not going into with this time period. The the problems that came out of colonization and and everything about the British Empire. That there's too much to unpack in. I think is even a series of of episodes. For us, anyway. I mean, I'm I'm not a historian, as as you know. I hope you know. Um, <laughs> but um, that's why it is important to talk about the characters as opposed to the people. Um, e- yes, yes, and and for them to make sure that we know that this show is fiction. Um, so I do think it's it's funny because you were mentioning the American Revolution. I completely forgot to even mention that 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 was you know that King George was the king that was on the throne during that time. George the Third. George the Third. Um, his mental illness or kind of the gossip of his mental illness went all the way to uh, the colonies. There they can't prove whether or not this actually happened with King George, but there was a rumor that spread that I think went to the the colonies newspapers at the time that he was going through the palace saying that he was George Washington and that the that he was going to fight off the British, which had if that was real, had to horrify people in the palace because he thought that he was his main adversary at the time and that he was going to, you know, bring down the British. Now, you know, there was a lot of kind of untrue things in the papers back then. Back and, then. <laughs> but there was there was you know, there was a lot of these things that kind Don't of sue me. <laughs> there was a lot of these stories that were wives' tales, or yes. you know, that that were circulating around. So they can't prove that that actually happened, but that was a story that was told that he didn't have his wits about him. So his mental illness had had spread so far that it wasn't just the inner circle that knew that about him the entire country and i'm i'm guessing other parts of the british empire knew that that he was struggling with this and didn't even well, know you know to yeah. what extent really but don't forget as well that by the the time period of the uh, of bridgerton of the show um in its in its current era um it's roughly the 1810s which is literally the regency period because in 1811 was when george the third um accepted the regency which was where his son well he became the prince yeah. regent but the the oh, the heir assumptive or whatever you call it um so the heir became the regent and ruled in in his stead and he he had to accept that by 1811 but the the story that that we're talking about in terms of the the younger george and charlotte would have been quite a lot earlier actually um in terms of um history it was so the the entire country know that the king isn't um well well because he's accepted the regent um and so they they all know that yeah so that's it's less of it's at that time period it is not um hidden however earlier on it very much was yeah yeah so this was only going to be one episode of a recap, but this has gone on for three hours. So we're going to do two parts. So this is the end of part one. This is the end of part one and continue watching the next episode for part two. 